All right, everybody, let's get started for this afternoon. Very good to see everybody here. How's, how's everybody doing this afternoon? Doing all right? Okay, so the subject for today, we're going to be learning about what we call kinematics. So this is really the science of motion. And the three concepts that we're really going to be focusing about today are these related concepts of displacement, velocity, and acceleration. That's what we're going to be focusing on today. Has anybody covered any of these topics before in any other courses? Okay, a few people. Where did you um, do this before? Okay, okay, very good, didn't maths. And where did you do it before? Okay, in maths, okay, very interesting. So if you have covered some of these concepts before, we might be approaching them a little bit differently in this module. So maybe there's going to be some overlap, maybe there's going to be some things which are a bit different, uh, which are a bit new. So it might be interesting to do a bit of a kind of compare and contrast there. The other thing I'd like to ask you guys, has anybody done calculus before? Okay, some people, okay, some people done calculus before. So if you haven't done calculus before, that's absolutely fine. We're not going to be assuming or directly using any ideas from calculus. We're actually going to be approaching these topics with algebra and geometry. So two very powerful approaches to understand these topics. If you have done a bit of calculus before, you might be able to see the connections between some of the ideas that we're covering today and some of the things that you've covered in calculus. So if you have done some calculus and you can see those connections, then that's fantastic. If you haven't done calculus before, please don't worry about it. We're just going to be using algebra and geometry. Last thing before we kick things off is do remember my challenge from last week's to try and write down one question from every lecture that you go to. So not just from this module, but in all the lectures that you go to. Has anybody uh, given it a try yet in some other, other courses? Okay, so do try and give it a go today. Now, maybe there's going to be something in the lecture which isn't too clear. Maybe I don't explain it so well. That's going to be an obvious thing to ask a question about. But it doesn't just have to be a question about that. Maybe you're covering similar topics in, you know, maths or engineering. Maybe we do things a bit differently in this module. That's a great thing to ask a question about. Or even if there's just any ideas here which you think, oh, hey, that's kind of interesting. I wonder if there's a different direction we can take that. That's a great thing to ask about. So there's plenty of things, plenty of directions that you can ask questions about, not just uh, if there's something you don't understand. I do take a moment to ask if you guys have questions during the lecture, but please do just put your hand up and ask if you do have any questions as we're going along. You don't need to wait um, until I ask. And do remember that if there's something you're not sure about, probably there's going to be lots of other students who are also in the lecture who are also not sure about that. They're going to really appreciate if you ask that question. So please do take on this challenge. Try and write down one question from the lecture and do ask if you have any questions as we go along. Let's take a look at what the plan is for today. So the two main topics that we're going to be thinking about today are really what we call kinematics diagrams and kinematics equations. So we're going to have equations to describe the motion of the kinds of objects that we're considering. And we can also represent this motion in terms of diagrams. Now you'll probably notice that I'm always, always, that I'm almost always saying, draw a diagram, draw a sketch of the situation. It's very helpful with understanding what's going on. And I think no more so than when we're thinking about kinematics. And the thing I'd really like to emphasize all week is making the connections between these two different approaches to motion. So I don't want to be thinking of diagrams and equations as two different things. I want to be seeing them as two different ways to represent the same thing and really emphasizing the connections between the two because that's such a powerful way to really unlock an understanding of kinematics. 
the concepts that we're going to be looking at specifically for today, we're going to be looking at the relationship between displacement and velocity. So we've already heard a bit about displacement and velocity, and I'd really like to explore those ideas in some more detail, especially thinking about them in terms of kinematics diagrams. The next concept that we're going to think about for today is the relationship between velocity and acceleration. Now, we've all heard of acceleration. Everybody knows you know, where the accelerator pedal is. Everybody knows what it does. But in physics, in kinematics, acceleration can actually be quite counterintuitive. So we're going to understand some of those concepts in a bit more detail. And then the key thing that we're going to be working towards is the relationship between displacement and acceleration. Now, the relationship between the first two concepts is a bit more straightforward. But when it comes to the relationship between displacement and acceleration, it gets a bit more interesting. So that's really what I'd like to be focusing towards. Now, you might be wondering, well, maybe I'm not super interested in motion and rockets and cannons and all this kind of stuff that we think about with kinematics. Why is this such an important topic for everyone? And the reason is that understanding kinematics is absolutely essential for understanding energy. We simply can't understand energy as we talk about it in science without really understanding what we mean by kinematics. So that's why it's so important that everybody, whichever degree you're studying, certainly for physics and engineers, but if you're studying chemistry or biology, why it's so important to understand these concepts because we need to understand these concepts for energy. And you need to understand energy to understand everything. So it's so important for everybody, whichever course you're studying. So that's the basic plan for today and sort of where we're going to be going with it. Before I jump right into the details, I'd just like to spend a bit of time on this fantastic picture that I have on the background of the slide today. Let's take a look at it in more detail. Has anybody seen a picture like this before? Does anybody know what's going on in this picture? Yeah? Do you want to tell us what's going on here? Yeah, it's the landing of the space age uh, uh, landing Absolutely fantastic. Did everybody hear that? So it's an absolutely stunning photo of a SpaceX booster landing on a drone ship in the middle of the ocean. And I think this is one of the most extraordinary, one of the most impressive engineering feats of the past few years, really. It's just an absolutely stunning achievement. When I first heard that SpaceX were planning to land their rockets on ships, no less, in the middle of the ocean, I thought they were totally crazy. And I think a lot of other people did as well. Now, if you want to do something like land a rocket booster on a ship in the middle of the ocean, you absolutely definitely have to understand all of the kinematics concepts that we're going to be learning about this week. It's absolutely uh, central. There's actually a more important point that I'd like to make about how this is done specifically and how we're going to be approaching physics in the rest of the module. And I'd really like to demonstrate that by showing you guys one of my favorite YouTube videos. Maybe some of you might have seen it before. It's actually been described as the most expensive YouTube video ever made. So I hope you guys all appreciate it. And like I said, if you've seen it before, I've seen it loads of times. I think it gets better every time. So just give me a moment. I'll dial up the, the, uh, the movie and we'll take a watch, OK? All right, did you guys like that? I, I think it's a great video. Has anybody seen it before? But it just, it just gets better every time. Right? I have watched it, let's say, more than once. Um, so like I said, it is probably the most expensive YouTube video ever made. So I hope you guys did enjoy it. There's actually a serious point that I'd like to make about that video, especially when it comes to learning physics, okay? 
let's take a look at this picture here. So this is an absolutely beautiful picture of the first booster to ever land on the landing zone on the ground there. So not just a really beautiful picture. Don't you guys think that's just a really beautiful picture? It's, sorry? Very good? Yeah, it really is, isn't it? It really is very aesthetic. Absolutely beautiful picture with the, the sunset there. But it's a super important picture because it really changed the status quo of putting things into orbit. And that really is changing the world with reducing the cost of putting things into orbit. But there's a very important lesson for how they got there. And it's a very important lesson to bear in mind when we're learning physics. And in a nutshell, this is all about learning from mistakes. And it's so important not to worry too much about not making mistakes, but to keep learning from them. So whenever we're learning anything, mistakes are essential. If we take a look at everything that happened in the video, I got, I got a list written down of everything that went wrong there. Let's take a look, okay. So first time, there was an engine sensor failure, then they uh, ran out of liquid oxygen, uh, there's a stuck throttle valve, ran out of hydraulic fluid, uh, landing leg collapsed, uh, landing burn failed, radar glitch, uh, then they ran out of propellant. So loads and loads of things went wrong every time. What's really interesting though, is that they didn't make the same mistake twice. Every time something went wrong, they figured out what went wrong and they fixed it and they didn't make that mistake again. And things didn't work the first time. Things didn't work the second time, or the third, or the fourth, or the fifth, or the sixth, or the seventh, or even the eighth time. They kept on making mistake after mistake after mistake, but they never made the same, same mistake twice. And they always figured out what was wrong, and they always fixed it, and they always learned from it. And that's how you make progress. That's how you do something extraordinary, like landing a rocket booster. And it's so important to bear this in mind when we're learning physics because I think it's very easy when it comes to learning things in exams and it's got to be A stars all the time and everything's super assessed. It's very easy to be very worried about making mistakes but the thing is if you don't want to make any mistakes then you don't end up making anything. So the thing I want to emphasize is that small mistakes they're really not a disaster. So if you look in the textbook over here there's loads of small mistakes in the textbook, loads of little typos. If you look at the answers, there's loads of little things wrong with the numbers there. As I start putting some more equations, doing some more working out on the blackboard as we get into the semester, I'm sure I'm going to make some mistakes. I'm sure I'm going to get some things back to front. Maybe there's going to be some mistakes in the slides. Maybe there's going to be some typos, but it's really not a disaster. The important thing is though, don't be careless, okay? It's important to catch your mistakes, to fix them, and to learn from them. So if you remember last week, I told you guys about this approach to units. We don't think about units as just the cherry on the cake. We can see from our units if we've made any mistakes. That's a very powerful way to check your work, to see if you've made a mistake, and if you have, to catch it and try and fix it. So that's just one uh, very important approach there. The key point, the key thing that I'd like you guys to take away from this is don't let small mistakes get in the way of building your understanding. If we're going through something in a workshop and maybe you get a fraction the wrong, wrong way around or you get an exponent the wrong way around or you miss a minus sign or something like that, it's just a small mistake. It's not a disaster. So don't let that get in the way of building your understanding. The important thing is to build a really strong, solid understanding of the subject. And once you have that, even if you do make small mistakes here and there, it's not such a big deal. So next time you're trying a physics problem, maybe you're trying a question in here, maybe you're trying a question in the workshop, don't worry too much about making a mistake. If you're not sure, give it your best guess, okay? Because it's really essential for learning. And that's the kind of key point that I want to emphasize about that. 
Does anybody have any questions that they want to ask before we uh, move on? So, do you remember my challenge? It's absolutely fine if you don't want to ask a question in the lecture like that, but I really would encourage everybody, try and write down one question from the lecture today. We can certainly go over it in the drop-in workshop right after this, or we can talk about it in the workshops at the end of the week, okay? So, do try your best, try and think of one question from the rest of the lecture. Okay, after all that, let's move on to the kinematics topics of today, okay, the things we're going to be focusing on. And the place we're going to be starting is the relationship between displacement and velocity. And a really important way to understand these concepts is by thinking about them in terms of a diagram. So let's take a look at that. Let's get started with some kinematics. So what I've got here is a graph. And on the horizontal axis, over here, so we've got time on the horizontal axis. And on the vertical axis, we've got displacement. So it's a displacement versus time diagram. Now, if you want to sound really fancy, you can call this a space-time diagram. Wow, that sounds really fancy. Because on this axis, we have space, and on this axis, we have time. So that really does sound super fancy, OK? Uh, but it really is just a graph of position versus time. What I have in this example is, let's just think about a situation where maybe someone, you maybe in your car over here, and at the moment your position, maybe you're, you're at home. And you're going to go on a little drive, you're going to drive over to work, you're going to stay at work, you're going to do an honest day's work, and then when the day is done, you're going to go home. Let's see what that looks like on the displacement versus time graph there. Let's take a look. Okay, so we're starting off at home and we want to get to work over there. So we just have our position, it's just along this axis here. So we set out in our car and we start driving towards work here. And then we get to work. So once we get to work, you find somewhere to park and you just leave your car. So our position versus time for this part looks like this. Now don't be confused because it might look like the car's moving. You might think, well, maybe it's still going somewhere. But look carefully at the position. The position doesn't change as time moves on. So even though it kind of looks like the graph is moving, the car isn't going anywhere. Its displacement is zero. So then maybe it gets to 5 p.m., the end of a long day at work, and you think it's time to go back home. So you get back in your car and you drive back home. And this is what it looks like. And now you're back at home. So that was a nice day. That's a simple example of what a journey might look like on a position versus time diagram. We can relate these concepts to velocity by thinking about how long that journey took and how far we covered. Now, whenever you have something like this where there's multiple different parts, don't try and deal with it all at once. Break it into small manageable pieces and deal with each piece at a time. So let's just start with the first piece of this journey when we're driving to work. So we've covered a certain displacement. So that delta S, that's our change in displacement. So how far it takes for us to get to work. So maybe if you live 10 miles away from work, your displacement 10 miles. And then we have that delta T there. So how long it took to drive there. So maybe you have a 15 minute drive, 20 minute drive, that would be your delta T. Once we have our delta T and our delta S, we can relate them to our velocity. If you remember last week, we saw velocity, it's just our displacement divided by our time. Now I'm sure in some sense, this might all be familiar because Whenever we're talking about speeds, we always say, OK, your speed in a car, maybe it's 50 miles per hour. And we know what that means. That means in one hour, 
you drove 50 miles. If you wanted to drive 100 miles, that's going to take two hours. That's really what that little equation is telling us there. Once we have this equation, we can calculate all kinds of nice things, right? So if we know our speed and our time, we can calculate the displacement. Or if we know the displacement and time, we can calculate the speed and all that, that sort of thing. The thing I'd really like to emphasize today is to make a connection between what's going on with this equation and what's going on in a graph of velocity versus time. So over here, we have displacement versus time. Let's think about what a similar graph of velocity versus time would look like. So right above this, here we've got velocity versus time. Let's have a think about what our velocity versus time is going to look like for this journey. So let's just think about this first part where we're driving to work. Let's think what that velocity is going to look like. So remember that velocity, it's just the slope of our displacement versus time graph. So for this first part of the journey, we have some positive slope, some positive velocity. So our velocity versus time just looks like that green line up there. Our velocity is just constant. And all that's telling us is when we're driving to work, we have a constant velocity. So obviously in real life, you know, that's a bit of an idealization. You know, that you're going to be stuck in traffic and all that kind of stuff. But in this example, we're just thinking you're driving to work maybe at a nice constant velocity that, you know, could be 30 miles an hour, something like that. Have a think about what the next part of the diagram is going to look like for this part of the journey when we're parked at work. Before I show you guys, just take a minute to draw in in your own notes, what you think this part of the diagram is going to look like when we're parked at work here. Have a think about what that's going to look like. This is good. I'm seeing people drawing. I'm seeing people drawing. Have a think what that part of the journey is going to look like. Very good. I'm seeing people drawing. I'm seeing people thinking about it. This is excellent. Okay. Okay, has everybody had a go? Everybody got a, got a sketch? Okay, so let's take a look at this. So for this part where we're just at work, we do have some time, some time passes. Maybe you spend eight hours at work, maybe you spend nine hours at work, something like that. But our displacement is zero because we're parked at work. So for this part of the diagram, our velocity is zero. So that's what our velocity looks like. Did anybody get that in their, in their notes when they drew that? I'm seeing some thumbs up. All right, all right, fantastic, fantastic. Okay, that's great. That's really good. So now let's think about the last part of this diagram when we're driving back home, okay? So again, before I show you guys, give it a go yourself. Try and draw that own part of the diagram in your own notes. Have a think about what that's going to look like. This is actually the trickiest part of the diagram. I'll give you guys just a moment to, to give this one a go. So maybe check with the people around you. I know some people, they got the middle part of the diagram. All right, so check with them, see what you think for this last part. What's that last part gonna look like? So remember velocity, it's the slope of the displacement versus time diagram. So think about what the slope of that last part of the diagram is. Let's take a look, let's see what it is. So for the last part, we're driving back home and our velocity is negative. Who got that? Did anybody get that? All right, all right, fantastic. That's brilliant. Very well done, everyone, okay? Um, so as we'd say in that kind of vector parlance, it's the same magnitude. Maybe we're driving back home at the same speed as we went to work, but it's in a different direction because we're driving back. So whereas over here, we say our velocity is positive. When we get over here, 
our velocity is negative. So very well done, everybody who got that right, if you were drawing the sketch along in your own notes. Okay, that's a fantastic start to thinking about kinematics. Okay, so very well done. I just have a couple more points to make about this before we move on. Okay, so first of all, if we start with this equation, we can do a little bit of algebra, a little bit of rearranging, and we can solve for what our displacement is in terms of our velocity and time. So just a little bit of algebra there. A point that I want to emphasize here okay, is this equation here is only true if we have a constant velocity. So every year when it comes to marking exams, there's going to be some question where the velocity isn't constant and we want to calculate what the displacement is and somebody uses this equation. So this equation is only valid if our velocity is constant. If our velocity is changing, we can't use this equation. So don't be that person, okay? Don't be that person. So that's the basic idea with relating velocity and time and displacement. And over here, we've got the kind of equation way of looking at things. And over here, we have the diagram way of looking at things. And I really want to emphasize, it's super important that you get very familiar with working with both. And so maybe we've got a diagram over here, we can write up what the equation is and vice versa. So let's try a couple of examples. I've got a couple of examples to try. So let's get them going. Let's see what we get here. Okay, so these questions, you might think they're deceptively simple. But they can be quite tricky, but they're super important for understanding kinematics. So let's take a look at what's going on in this question. At the top there, with that blue line, I have a graph of displacement versus time. So my question for you guys is, which of these four graphs is the corresponding graph of velocity versus time? Okay, let's take a look at the responses. What do we have here? So not so many people go in for B, pretty equal for C and D, and not so many people going for A. Okay, C and D. So remember that um, velocity, it's the slope of our displacement versus time diagram. So it looks like a lot of people got that to start with our displacement, we're kind of going downwards, so our slope is negative. Looks like a lot of people got that. Now this is where it can get a bit tricky because if you look halfway through the diagram, our displacement goes negative. So maybe we're above some height and we're kind of moving down and then we get to, you know, it could be sea level, something like that, and then we keep on going down. It could be something like that. Or maybe we're you know, north of the equator and we're driving south and then we get to the equator and then we keep on going south. Could be something like that as well for our displacement. But remember that our velocity is the slope of this graph. So even though halfway through our displacement goes negative, look carefully at the slope. The slope doesn't change. And this is a really important point with these concepts. So our displacement has gone negative but our velocity hasn't changed. So maybe if you think about this example, we're north of the equator and we're driving south and we get to the equator and we just keep on driving. We don't suddenly stop and dr drive up north again. So our velocity actually looks like option C here, this constant negative one. So very well done, everybody who gave that one a go, okay? So I do want to emphasize, just like we saw in the, the video to start with, okay? Don't worry too much about making mistakes, okay? So if you didn't get this one right, that's absolutely fine. The important thing is to engage with the question, give it your best go, okay? And we're gonna have plenty more examples, and I'm sure you guys are all gonna get this, okay? So very well done, everybody who gave this one a go. So that's thinking about displacement and velocity in terms of diagrams, but it's so important to also be able to do the math. So that was a question about diagrams. I'd like to give you guys another question, but now instead of kind of diagrams, we're kind of doing a bit of a calculation. So let's see what we get for this one. So the question is, we know how far away the moon is. 
and we know the speed of light. So my question for you guys is, how long does it take for light to reach us from the moon? I'll just emphasize my hint here, okay? Try writing out this equation before reaching for your calculator. Reach for your calculator, the last thing. That's gonna make your life much easier with this question. Let's take a look at the responses, see what everybody got here. Let's have a look, what have we got here? All right, okay, okay, great. So, looks like everybody, most people got the, the 1.28, okay. So, so, who wrote out the equation before reaching for your calculator? Who gave that a go? Okay, so why is that so useful with this question? Any thoughts on that? Why was it really helpful to work it out on paper? Yeah. Okay, so you do have to rearrange it. That's really important. But does any, can anybody spot why for this one especially, it's really useful to, to write it out and only reach for a calculator last thing? Oh, yeah? Fantastic. Very good. Did everybody hear that? It's because you can cancel out the 10 to the 8 business. Okay. So did anybody work it out on their calculator without putting in the 10 to the 8 business? Okay, great. Very well done, you guys. That's great work. Okay. So just to uh, spell that out, okay. If we take a look at the distance, it's 3.84 times 10 to the 8 meters. And then if we take a look at the speed of light, it's 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Now, you can put both of those into your calculator with the 10 times 10 to the 8 business, okay? That will work. But if you write out the equation first, you're going to see that those 10 to the 8s, they both cancel. So all you need to put into your calculator is 3.84 divided by 3, which is a much easier thing to put into your calculator. So pro tip when you're working things out, especially in an exam, this is just going to save you guys a bit of time. It's going to make it a bit less likely to make a mistake. Because maybe you're putting in the times 10 to the 8, and maybe the to the 8 bit doesn't go right, and you end up putting in, you know, times 108 or, you know, something like that, okay? Or maybe you only put one of the 10 to the 8s in, or one's 10 to the minus 8. You know, there's all kinds of ways it can go wrong when you put the numbers in your calculator. But if you just think a little bit carefully before reaching straight for your calculator, you see those 10 to the 8s, they just cancel out. And then it's a much easier calculation. I mean, you can really just do that in your head, right? Because it's something a bit more than 3 divided by 3. So it's really got to be something a bit more than 1. So you don't even really need your calculator at all, okay? So if you take that approach, it's going to make your life much easier when it gets to the exam. And you're not going to make small mistakes by getting things wrong with your calculator. So very well done, everybody who gave that one a go. So I have another question for you guys. So what we have here, this is a graph of velocity versus time. So remember, it's not a graph of displacement versus time. It's a graph of velocity versus time. So think about what this graph might physically represent. What might be going on here? Think up a situation that might kind of go along with this graph. And my question for you guys is, what does the area under that graph correspond to? And by under the graph, I mean the area between where the velocity is and the uh, horizontal axis there. What does that area correspond to? So remember, top tip for these kind of questions, it's always helpful to think about the units, okay? I'm a big fan of units. Units are going to help you out every time. Okay, let's see uh, what everybody gets here. Let's see what people get for this one. Okay, oh, so people going for B and D. Nobody's going for momentum or area. Okay, so very well done, everybody, because you've all seen that it's going to be some kinematics concept. Let's look carefully at what the units are going to be. So on the vertical axis, we have units of meters per second. And then on the horizontal axis, we have units of seconds. So when we multiply them together, this area is going to have units of meters. Now, I know it might be a bit counterintuitive to think about an area 
with units of meters. But remember, it's an area of a graph. It's not a physical area like you know, a piece of paper or something like that. So if we have something with units of meters, then it's got to be displacement. Okay, so option B. So very well done, everybody who got that one right. Okay. Just to emphasize the point that I said at the beginning of the lecture, it's very easy to just make a little mistake and get something wrong with the seconds. And instead of you know, multiplying by the seconds, you maybe divide or you get the minus one wrong. And that's exactly why you might get acceleration instead of displacement. So I really want to emphasize, don't worry too much about small mistakes like that. The important thing is to engage with the question and give it your best go. Okay, so very well done, everybody who gave that question a go. Let's do a bit of a recap at this point and see what's going on here. So what we have here, let me just move the little uh, code out of the way. There we go. So what we have here is, if we think about this graph of displacement versus time, we can get to the graph of velocity versus time by thinking about the slope of this graph. If you've done some calculus, we might say that's the derivative of this. So velocity is the derivative with respect to time of displacement. So that's going to give us our velocity. So in this case, that slope's constant, so our velocity it's constant. That's what our velocity versus time looks like. So then how do we get from velocity versus time back to displacement versus time? Well, that's the area under the graph there. So we can get to that either geometrically by thinking about what the area is, or if you've done some calculus, you might recognize that as the integral of velocity versus time. That's going to give us the displacement. So in one slide, that's really the relationship between those two concepts. Let's move on and think about acceleration, because that's the next crucial piece of the puzzle here. Let's start by thinking about what are the units for acceleration, OK? So let me get this one going. We'll see what the units of acceleration are. So just a hint. Start by thinking about the units of velocity. I remember that acceleration is how much velocity changes with time. So think which of these are going to be the units of acceleration. Let's take a look. Let's see what we get here for acceleration. So most people go in for A, but we do have some other ones covered, OK? So remember, the units for velocity, that's meters per seconds. So we'd write that as meters seconds to the minus one. That's what we mean by that. And then acceleration is how much that changes. So that's going to be meters per second per second. So we write that as meters per second squared or meters second to the minus two. So the correct answer is option A over there. So very well done, everybody who got that one OK. Um, you probably have noticed by now how much I like thinking about units. So the last slide for today, let's take a look at some more kinematics diagrams. But instead of for displacement versus time, let's see what it looks like for acceleration versus time. So in this situation, I thought, let's start with the classic example of something accelerating. So this idea that sparked Newton off on thinking about gravity. So let's think about an apple falling from a tree. So to start with, the apple, it's just sitting there. It's just minding its own business. It doesn't have any velocity. So it's just sitting there. And as time goes by, the apple doesn't move. It doesn't have any velocity. At some point, the apple falls off the tree. And as it's falling towards the ground, it's accelerating towards the ground. Then at some point, it's going to hit the ground and its velocity is going to very suddenly go back to zero and then it's going to be on the ground. So it's going to look something like this. And then it's just going to be on the ground again, minding its own business. So that's an example of what a velocity versus time diagram might look like if something's accelerating. So remember that the relationship between velocity and acceleration is 
how much we've changed our velocity in a certain amount of time. So we can write that down as an equation like this. So our acceleration, it's our change in velocity divided by how long that change in velocity took. So you might be able to guess what's happening. If we think about maybe this time interval here, this is where the interesting stuff is going on. So in this time interval here, the apple changed its velocity by this much. So that's what its delta v is. So let's have a think about what our graph of acceleration versus time is going to be in this situation. So if we have acceleration versus time, it's also very useful to divide this up into pieces over here. So let's start by thinking about this, this piece here, okay? So when the apple is falling, its acceleration is negative. So acceleration, it's the slope of the velocity versus time graph. And our apple's falling, the velocity is getting more and more negative, the slope is negative. So our acceleration is negative. Does anybody know what the acceleration due to gravity is? Nine point, I'm here in nine point something. If, yeah, very good. So it's 9.81 meters per second squared downwards. So in, if this is an apple and it's falling on Earth, that's what that acceleration is going to be. So have a go in your notes. Fill in the acceleration for those other pieces there. Have a think what that's going to look like. So time is still passing, but our velocity isn't changing. So what's our acceleration going to look like? So to start with, it's just going to look like that. Our acceleration is zero. It's not accelerating. Is that what people got in their sketch? All right, very good. And then in the last piece, that's what our acceleration is going to look like. So again, it's on the ground, and it's just not going anywhere. So the last couple of points that I want to make for today so we can rearrange this equation and we can solve for what our velocity is. So what do we get here? Velocity, it's just our acceleration multiplied by our time. So what is our acceleration and how long have we been accelerating like that for? Just a bit of algebra there. The last point I want to make for today is that when we talk about acceleration in everyday language, we almost always mean getting fast, right? So we've got a pedal in the car, the accelerator pedal, and it makes the car go faster. And if we want to slow down, we talk about deceleration. So in physics, we never talk about deceleration because in physics, when we talk about acceleration, we just mean we're changing our velocity, not necessarily increasing it. So even if we're decreasing our velocity, a physicist would still say we're accelerating. So to a physicist, if you have the accelerator pedal and the brake pedal in a the car, they're both the accelerator pedal because they both change the velocity of the car. So that's just a little bit of uh, technicality there. So just watch out for that if we're talking about velocities decreasing. So that's a kind of first introduction to displacement, velocity, and acceleration. And in the next lecture, we're going to be looking in more detail about how we can relate acceleration and displacement. And things get a lot more interesting. So um, that's all for today. Um, thank you all for listening. Very well done, everybody, with the questions. And I'll see you all on Thursday. So I'll see you then.